Well, tonight we're on our fifth session, and those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you can go to our website, teacherthebible.com, and you can download the notes and the PowerPoint and any video or audio sessions that we have for this class. Just click on the Classes tab, go down to the Song of Songs, and you can watch or download anything that you need. Tonight we are going to cover the 16 verses of chapter 5, and I've titled this A New Couple in Conflict. The truth is it's not all about conflict. Uh, The first verse uh, should actually have been part of chapter 4. It goes right with verse 16 of the previous chapter, so they put a break at the wrong point. And a a really obvious break should have been at the end of verse 1 there. They should have been part of chapter 4. And then we could have started with this next section here in verse 2. But So in verse 1, there's three parts tonight. In verse 1, they have sex on wedding night. Uh, Verses 2 through 8, the woman has another dream. Probably that's what she had was a dream. And they are conflict and tension that we can talk about. And then in verse 9, uh, the daughters of Jerusalem ask the uh, Shulamite woman, why should we help you find this guy? He's a rat. <laughs> and she's going to praise him. Verses 10 through 16, she's going to praise her husband, which is a very powerful thing in the marriage relationship. When you find that which is good in your husband. So so there's three sections. The uh, verse 1 where they're intimate, verse 2 where they um, experience this ebb and flow of conflict, and then uh, verses 10 and following where she praises her man. So let's read now, um, starting with verse 1, and let's go to verse 8, read that part of it, and then we're going to go uh, in the second part, we're going to start with verse 9, this, these two questions that the daughters of Jerusalem ask her and will answer. She's going to answer that question in verses 10 through 16. So Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 1 through 8 says, I, this, this is the man speaking here. Tonight, almost everything is the woman speaking. So this is the only verse where the man speaks. I've come to my garden, my sister, my spouse, or my bride. I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And then the friends, probably the women, the same daughters of Jerusalem, uh, are speaking here. It says, eat, O friends, drink, yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. And now from here, verses 2 through 8, the woman is going to speak. She says, I sleep, and my heart is awake. And again, what is, it, what is she tuned into? She's tuned into the words of her husband, so the voice of my beloved. So, uh, so she's repeating what she hears him say. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love my dove, my perfect one, or flawless, the NIV says flawless one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. She says, I've taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? I've washed my feet, how can I defile them or soil them? My beloved put his hand by the latch. And here in the New King James, in the King James, you see of the doors in italics, So that wasn't in the original language. So by the latch, that's where he put his hand. Uh, And my heart yearned for him. She says, I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away, and he was gone. So she loses him again, (laughs) as she did in chapter 3. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who went about the city, they found me. And and notice here, they kind of beat her up. They struck me. They wounded me. 
the keepers of the walls, took my veil away from me. I charge you, daughters, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am lovesick. I'm sick with love. I'm weak, faint with love. All right, so um, that's where we are there. I didn't even put that up there, huh? So we are going to talk here a little bit about conflict. <clears throat> um, but this first verse is the clearest reference in the song to sexual intercourse. Verse 16 of the previous chapter, they're having intercourse. And here also in verse 1. So he, ho he obeys her call. Um, and in verse 16, she says, come to him. And she says, come and eat. And then in verse 1. One here, he says, I have come and I have eaten. And then the friends kind of echo what they're doing. They're not actually there, but they're echoing this little chorus. They say, eat and drink. So these are clearly terms of um, sexual and uh, intercourse and lovemaking. If you could turn me down just a little bit on number one on the volume there on the white knob. <clears throat> So in verse 16, she says, let my lover come into his garden. But now here in verse five, uh, five, verse one, he says, I have come into my garden. So she said, I'm the garden. She says, come to his garden. She called it his garden. And now she's, he's saying, I have come to my garden. So he kind of possesses her basically in a good way, not a bad way. And um, if you'll notice in this verse one, you'll see the possessive pronoun my nine times. My garden, my sister, my spouse, my myrrh, my spice, my honeycomb, my honey, my wine, my milk. So it's like, it's exactly what she had been wanting all along. He's mine, I'm his. So <clears throat> um, he hasn't, Longman says he hasn't just had her wine, but also her milk. Uh, not only her honey, but also her comb, her honeycomb. He has possessed her completely, a fitting image of sexual intercourse. So now they are together. Now they're one. Uh, just as uh, the Lord said, the two shall become one flesh, not just one spirit, but one flesh, to consummate the marriage relationship. So you can't get any closer than that. That's as close as you're going to get. <clears throat> Knight says, we read, I came, I gathered, I ate, I drank. Um, his experience was thus a kind of divine banquet set forth for both of them by a loving God. God set it all up that they would be together, that they would be in love, and that they would be together on this wedding night. The honeycomb, honey, milk, probably are referring, for, I'm just going to use this as one example, it's probably referring to kissing and lips because if we back up to the previous chapter, verse, chapter 4, verse 11, she says, um, he says, your lips, O my spouse, drip as the honeycomb, honey and milk are under your tongue. So he's drinking of that, he's tasting of that, he's kissing her, so they're being very intimate here. And... Do you remember when we first started the Song of Songs, the very first verse, besides the title of the book? Remember what she said, let him kiss me, let him kiss me with his mouth. You know, your love is better than wine. And all along, there's many, many verses in the Song of Songs, and we're going to see two of them here again tonight, especially verse 16, where uh, it's talking about kissing in the mouth and, and, and being intimate. <clears throat> and I just... I want to say this about kissing. Um, we, as Christians, are very good at telling people what not to do, if you guys have noticed that. We have all these commands. You can't do this. You can't fornicate. You can't commit adultery. You can't do, you know, all the things. You can't do homosexuality. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. Don't hold hands. Don't do this. And you leave people bound up, but we never tell them what they can do. <laughs> And especially in the marriage relationship. And I want to tell you that, again, this is a divine revelation that's given by the Holy Spirit to show us how to do things in a marriage relationship. 
And I want to say to you that kissing is the dynamic thing that sets off romance, lovemaking, intercourse, all of that, okay? I'm just going to say it that way. Kissing is the avenue. It arouses the woman. It arouses the man. They begin to secrete things in their private areas when they start kissing. And this is a key thing in lovemaking. And I just want to say, even on the basis of if there's no intercourse, just in the area of kindness and closeness and intimacy between a husband and a wife, kissing is critical. And we said at the very beginning, long, passionate kissings go out of marriage relationships when the marriage relationship starts getting in trouble. And I want to tell you that if a man and a woman who are married do this on a regular basis, it will keep you close. I promise you, <laughs> it will. And after I did the Song of Solomon the first time, I started kissing my wife a lot more in the home. Just walking down the hallway, I'd stop, I'd kiss her. In the kitchen, I'd stop and kiss her. And just kiss her everywhere. And... Um, I think it's important. Uh, obviously, sometimes the woman will say, what do you want? You know, <laughs> But we got to get beyond that and know that that is intimate, that is important, that is positive, that is staying connected to your wife on a physical level. And that's, I'm just going to say it that way. <clears throat> and we also know that when people are dating, as Paul said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Because, and I've said that, I've talked to people in premarital counseling, and I've told them many, many times, I go, okay, we're going to do me premarital counseling. I go, but you guys got to promise me one thing, don't start touching each other, because once you do that, you're going to go the wrong way, and you're going to be in bed, and we're going to have all kinds of problems. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, you know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, because once you start touching and once you start kissing, the fire is lit. And that's what Paul would say a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 7. It's better to marry than to burn. Once you start kissing, the fires are starting to get ignited. And remember, she already warned the women, don't awaken this love until the right time. And so um, we have to be careful with that. <clears throat> in the, uh, there was a picture that was missing on that. Did it show up, that picture on the screen? It didn't come up? In that one? Okay. Somehow it was missing. Um, <clears throat> Hubbard, I like what he says here about what these friends say about eat, oh, friends, drink. It's like a toast to the bride and groom. And these friends, the probably the daughters of Jerusalem, uh, the NEB says, drink until you are drunk with love. In fact, Hubbard correctly points out where it says drink deeply is literally to get drunk, not with wine or beer, but to get drunk with love. You're intoxicated. In other words, you know, you're, what we said earlier, your love is better than wine. So there's an intoxication that comes with love. They're, I mean, in the most intimate position. So they're going to be drunk with love. So the, to the toast concludes, uh, go on drinking and don't stop until you get drunk with your love making. So God wanted that kind of passion in the home. And man, what if we had that kind of passion in homes? Wouldn't be doing too much marriage counseling. <clears throat> Eat, my beloved. Drink all the love you want, is what the United Bible Society's translators say, is what they're saying. That's what he's telling. Take, partake of this. Give yourself fully to it, passionately. Hugh Weiler, the female commentator, lady commentator, she says else, elsewhere in the song, especially in the context of the preceding verses, the language of eating and drinking is associated with lovemaking. So <clears throat> um, that kind of rounds out what we were showing in uh, chapter 4 uh, that brought uh, the climax, really, both spiritually and physically. The climax of this book is right here, what happens here. This is what they were all aiming for. <clears throat> When we look at verses 2 through 6, I just want to kind of say what's happening in here, okay? Um, it was probably a dream, because she says I was asleep. 
um, but her heart was awake. So in other words, she was still going. Her mind was probably still going in the dream. But in those days, husbands and wives slept in separate bedrooms. And um, you can follow the sequence kind of this way as you read these verses. So first of all, he shows up late, okay? He's, you know he's been outside for a while because his head is covered with dew and his locks are his locks with the drops of the night so he's been outside for a long time doesn't tell us what he was doing um, but he was outside for a long time now he's pleading to come in and in verse 3 she basically tells him sorry buddy you're too late (laughs) I'm already in bed I already took off all my clothes I was waiting for you I wanted to make love to you but you showed up late so I closed the door and then verse 4 he's basically saying no let me in (laughs) And by that time, though, he feels the rejection. And while she hears his voice, it kind of stirs her up and she has second thoughts. Oh, man, I probably shouldn't have been so hard on him. So she gets up then in verse 5 and goes and opens up to him. And he's gone because he feels rejected and he feels he, he's left already. So there's disappointment. There's misunderstanding. And then comes the silent treatment, right? So there's this. There's this, there's this going on right here, you know, right? There's this, this, is, this is the conversation that's happening. Can I say to you, <clears throat> I'm not a professional counselor. I don't have any kind of degree in counseling. I took a lot of counseling courses as part of my degrees to get what I have, but I'm not a professional counselor. They tell me not even to tell people that I counsel people, that you're, you're discipling, you're mentoring people, you don't really counsel people, you're not a certified counselor. So I'm fine with that. But... Can I tell you that many, 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 many marriages live in regular, constant frustration over this issue right here, the sexuality. The man wants to have sex. The woman doesn't. The woman wants to be romantic. The guy shows up and he's mad. And and then there's this tension, this conflict that comes into the home. It is the source of so much strife and problems, and most people don't realize it's regarding their sexuality. They want to be close, they want to be intimate, but different motivations, wrong hearts, wrong attitudes, anger, something went wrong during the day comes into the mix, and it causes conflict. It causes misunderstanding, it causes disappointments, it causes strife in the home. And Reading the Song of Solomon, I love it that this chapter, these words are in here because we can get this fuzzy, warm feeling that everything is about love and roses and, you know, you go out on dates and you're holding hands and you're walking through the rain, you know, and it's all this beautiful fairy tale. They lived happily ever after. But the truth is, as we all know, when you get in a marriage relationship, there's going to be disagreements. You're going to misunderstand each other. There's going to be wrong expectations. The man wants this. The woman wants that. And there's fighting and there's arguing that goes back and forth. And you have to learn as a Christian believer, how to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And that's a constant battle. When my wife and I got married, it was beautiful. Wedding night was beautiful. The next day we had tickets to go to Hawaii. My father-in-law bought us tickets for a whole week in Hawaii. And so we went to Hawaii. We held hands. We had pineapple. We went to the Dole a pineapple plant, we had pineapple ice cream, we went to a luau, we had dinner, we went to the beach. Uh, It was wonderful, all the way it was wonderful the whole week in Hawaii with my new wife. We were on our honeymoon, it was all fun and roses. We got off the plane, they put the little lay over your head, you know, you step off of the plane there in Hawaii, these these hula girls are dancing, everything was so beautiful, romantic, wonderful. There was even rainbows. It was rainy. My wife loves the rain. And then we flew back. We landed in Los Angeles. And somewhere around Bakersfield, we got into a fight. (laughs) The honeymoon is over. 
the argument started, and Irma gave me the silent treatment, and I wanted to know, and she told me, you don't understand what you did? And I go, no, I don't know. You have to tell me. I'm not a mind reader. And she's, you know, we got into this argument, and it was silence from Bakersfield all the way to Fresno. Quiet. And I thought, man, what happened to the romance? And what happened to the pineapple ice cream? And holding hands, and we were together. And, and when we got home, man, she slept on her side of the bed, and I slept on my side of the bed. And all the fun and games was, were over. Now reality set in, and now the real life, married life can begin, you know? So, well, we could all tell a thousand stories of misunderstandings and wrong things that we said. And, um, you know, you say one thing and your wife hears another thing. You, you mean one thing, your wife does something, and you, it's misunderstood, and there's a fight and there's an argument as well. Welcome to the real world. And, of course, that's what we try to warn people of, right, in premarital counseling a lot of times is like you guys are just – fun and we're on dates and everything's fun and you're getting ready for your wedding and wedding night and you're all excited but then you got to go to work and then you got to go do things so you guys all know all those things so so here most commentators agree that this is probably a dream she's kind of it's half dream half real you know she's kind of half in and half out stuff that takes place here like these guys beating her up it just doesn't even seem real because nothing happens that they just beat her up and then that's it you know and it's like it's that seems kind of weird and we'll talk about that in just a minute she calls you my lover the NIV my beloved repeatedly here she's they're married he's he's my lover so but there's a fight <laughs> And so he keep, she keeps saying this about, op, he, he her, hears her say this, open for me. Didn't even say open the door. It says open for me. Open. Uh, I arose to open, you know. She, I opened, verse 6, for my beloved. She wanted him to, to come in after a while. But uh, like Aiken says, he was late again. On this particular evening, work went out over the wife, and the stage was now set for a confrontation, a showdown in the bedroom. So there's a disagreement here, and things are not working out, and he feels rejected, he's upset. And How many of you have ever f seen a man who doesn't get what he wants sexually? He is grouchy. He'll put on a sad face. He'll complain. He'll put a guilt trip on you. He'll, he is, his shoulders are down and everything just, nothing works after that for the guy if he does not get what he wants. And you wives, you women, you know what I'm talking about. They get real grouchy. They get upset. They go to their room. They go to the bathroom. They, they just, they're all over the map, you know. So we do that. I wish somebody would say amen while I'm talking because you guys know what I'm dealing with. You guys know these are things that happen in the home. Don't tell me they don't happen. They do happen. <laughs> you know, you start massaging your wife's shoulders in the kitchen and she's doing dishes and you tell her how beautiful she is. And then she tells you, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. And all of a sudden the air just comes out of the room, you know, and He's gasping for air. <laughs> so what was he doing, Gil Glidhill says? We can only assume that it is a sudden romantic impulse that has driven him to seek his beloved at this late hour. And <clears throat> what did they say? Men are like microwaves and women are like crock, crock pots, right? Men are microwaves. They want to have sex and they want to have romance right now. You know, it's a romance. You know, the women wants to have, sit down with me, hold my hand. Let's watch a movie together. The guy goes, no, you know, let's kiss and go to bed, you know? And, and so we have this, the men have these impulses and sometimes women, and they've told me in counseling sessions repeatedly how men, they can't have, they, I, I, we just, we just had this last night, and you want it again today, you know, and it's like, get off of me, you know, get away from me. And it's just this, these impulses, and women don't understand why the men have such a drive like that. And uh, they say that men, within 24 hours, are ready to go again. And a woman's like, well, next week we can schedule this, you know. <laughs> so, again, 
there's this expectation and there's this reality that has to be worked out in a marriage. It does. I mean, this is real. This is for real. I mean, people don't, I don't know, people that have been married don't understand that. You and I have been married. You guys, we understand this. Um, Hubbard says the poem portrays the realisms of married life with its rhythm of frustration and delight. The two partners are not always ready for lovemaking at the same time, or one partner may not even be available when the other is eager. The road to true love is not always straight or smooth. Disappointments, delays, frustrations, there will be. <sighs> I wish it wasn't so. I wish it was Cinderella, you know. You, you, you come by. I wish every morning my wife would just drive in with a, you know, a horse-drawn carriage and I could just jump in and we lived happily ever after. Um, but no, my wife is not feeling well right now. <laughs> and I, I got to do, I got to wash the dishes and I got to clean the house and I got to do this and that. I got to do that. And my wife is not at all interested in me. She wants NyQuil and she wants to go to bed, you know, and I, I'm over there I'm going to go pray because I'm frustrated, you know. So apparently she had locked the door and gone to bed without him, Wiersbe says. So, yeah, sorry, you're too late. <laughs> well, he was too little, too late. He missed out on a golden opportunity to make love with her. She was ready, but he found her asleep and half awake, so... Proven says the dominating notes of the whole section are those of misunderstanding and missed opportunity. Is the fumbling, anxious side of male-female relationships that is in view here as the lovers fail to connect with each other and alienation enters their relationship. It's so simple, so subtle. It's not like they're going to divorce, but there's this disappointment that has to be dealt with. There's this alienation now. He goes to the back. He goes outside and I'm going to work in the garage all day. I don't want to talk to her, you know. She goes into the bathroom and closes the door, you know, and the guy's chasing after her. What's wrong? And, you know, all that kind of stuff. I've done that many times, chasing my wife. And I don't mind saying, because I've said it publicly, I've talked to her too about it. You know, my wife gets, she doesn't want to talk to me. Her favorite place is the bathroom, because it has a lock. You can lock it. And I go over there, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Well, if nothing's wrong, why is the door locked? Well, I don't want to talk to you. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. Why don't you want to talk to me? You know, it goes back and forth, and I get frustrated, and she stays in there, and she goes, I don't feel good. And Okay, I'll go pray. <laughs> you can get real spiritual during these times, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go pray, seek the Lord. You go ahead and get angry with me. I'm going to go pray. United Bible Society say, basically, she's saying, I've taken off my clothes. I'm not going to get dressed again. I just wash my feet, and I'm not going to get them dirty again. I'm just going to stay right here. And I love this. I love how, how Glidhill points this out, because here a woman is saying, hey, dude, you're not controlling me. i gone to bed, and I can't just... Uh, attend to your every whim whenever you want to come in and just barge into the bedroom and you want me to be all ready for you. So he says perhaps she, she is driving him wild with excitement at the suggestion that her unclothed body between sheets. By gentle, or maybe it's not so gentle, teasing, she wants him to know that she's in control. She's not at the mercy of his every whim. She's not going to be at his beck and call every moment of the day. And how many of you men have found that to be true? Your wife will tell you, back off, dude. And then you got to back off. And all of a sudden, there's this give and take, this ebb and flow that's in relationships. As Glickman says, even in the ideal romantic love that the song portrays, lovers encounter disappointment in the inevitable ebb and flow of emotional intensity. And so many men and, and women don't understand that. They don't understand, why can't my husband be romantic? Why doesn't he sit down and talk with me? Why can't we just have hold hands? Why can't we just hold hands? I've heard that before. I don't want to hold hands. <laughs> I want to I get beyond this. <laughs> 
This is boring holding hands. You know, the Cinderella story is two hours long. I don't want to wait to see the end of the Cinderella. I already know. Let's fast forward to the end of the Cinderella story. Well, you guys know this here at the top of page 75, that conflict is inevitable. It will happen, especially over sex. The Cinderella story is over. The honeymoon is over. Um, there's a story that I read um, in, uh, from the newspaper years ago from Dear Amy. Remember, it used to be Dear Abby? Well, the Abby twins passed away, so now there's Dear Amy. And it was a lady. She'd been married 24 years. As far as she knew, her, husband had, her and her husband had a fairly good relationship. They had kids. And um, he was a manager. He was an executive in a company. And he, was a, he did a lot of stuff through Facebook. And he did a lot of stuff through social media. And he did a lot of stuff through Twitter. And that's how he contacted people. That's how he, he got new contacts. He got more business, you know, by social media. That was his bread and butter. He contacted people. He posted a lot of stuff about his business and work and line of work on Facebook. And so consequently, he had people calling him and emailing him and sending him text messages and so on. And what this wife said about Dear Amy to Dear Amy, she says, you know what? Now when he, he works all day and when he comes home, I have dinner ready for him. And then I want him to just sit with me and watch the news or sit down and, you know, just talk about the day. But he goes right to his office and he's answering all these emails and he's answering, he's sitting there and he's putting all this time and effort into other men and women and leaving me out there sitting by myself on the couch. And she signed off lonely. That was her, that was her name. You know how they sign off on those Dear Amy ads? She signed off saying lonely. What do I do? And you know what? That is so typical both with men and women that they're investing all this time with all their friends through all their emails and text messages and phone calls and Twitter accounts and social media stuff and Facebook posts. And the husband and the wife are sitting there waiting, lonely. They're not talking. And, may, and maybe both of them are in their own rooms watching all their stuff on their laptop and on their computers, spending almost no time talking with one another. And we wonder why people are having affairs. We wonder why people are having problems in their marriage where there's no closeness, there's no intimacy, there's no love, there's no time together. With the man, it seems to always, he always seems to want sex. And the woman at times seems resistant. She can be in a romantic mood and she wants to spend time alone eating a dinner, watching a movie. But he's out working on his car, he's out on the computer, he's working in the yard. These moments of misunderstanding and failed expectations test the marriage relationship. They do. <clears throat> I want to put in a plug here for the importance of prayer. Nothing can bring about unity, oneness, like-mindedness, like a husband and wife praying together. The spiritual unity blesses the physical union. Um, I believe this. I've been taught it by other people. When I was first became a Christian, they always said that um, your success in the bedroom and physically started with your unity spiritually with your husband and with your wife. If there was no unity in the spirit, then it made the physical union all that much less attractive. But when you start united in the spirit and with the Lord and you bring that unity into the bedroom, it's very powerful. Again, the importance of agreement. How can two walk together unless they are agreed? And remember 1 Corinthians 7, 5, they said if you're going to spend time away from each other and not be involved physically with one another, it says you have to do it by mutual agreement. You have to agree together. Um, but then it says, get back together lest Satan tempt you um, for your lack of self-control. The best sex is spontaneous 
where there's a mutual attraction, a love, a spark that's there in the home. That's the best. But agreement in advance is also good. We're going to get together Friday night. We're going to get together Saturday night. There's agreement. There's no, no longer is there unreal expectations. No longer you're not dealing with reality. You're dealing with reality. You're agreeing together. You're going to spend time together. You're going to go on a date Friday night, and you're going to come home, or you're going to go out of town and spend time together. Communication is so critical. One of the whole sections we do in premarital counseling is on communication. Most people don't like talking frankly about sex. Some people, women don't even like to hear the word sex. Spell it out, S-E-X. I don't want to hear sex. Their expectations, we don't know what they are. The man wants to do it three or four times a week and the woman says no you know and so there's there's just a reality check that must be dealt with <clears throat> verse four the young woman hears her lover apparently trying to enter the room knowing that he's so close makes her anxious her heart now is pounding wildly the NIV says, my lover thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. And that's really what the word there means for heart, where it says, my heart yearned for him. Uh, in Hebrew, it was your inside, your very in, in your soul, the very the in, in part of, you, of who you are was really longing for him. Now, all of a sudden, she's, she's, her heart wants him. And she's excited now. The NIV provides a good cultural equivalent of the Hebrew, my insides leaped toward him, although the Hebrew expression allows for association with a specific sexual response. So she's all excited now. She's stirred up. He's there, and she's in bed, but she goes out. He, he, he already heard the no, <laughs> and he ran away. In fact, uh, this word here for heart is a little bit unusual because um, it's translated, the same Hebrew word is translated body down in verse 14. His body is carved, ivory. So, but it means your whole being, the whole inner part of who you are. She was stirred. Top of page 76, verse 5. The ERV says, I got up to open for my lover, my myrrh dripping from my hands, myrrh-scented lotion dripped from my fingers onto the handles of the lock. Longman says the mention of sweet-smelling ointment and the sensuous description of a thick, dripping liquid certainly add to the erotic atmosphere of this section. In other words, she was like ready to go, and she got excited, but then he's gone. <laughs> the myrrh signaled her readiness for love, Hubbard said. And note that she was she arose to open for her lover. Verse 5 and verse 6, I opened for my lover. I opened for my lover. That's who she was opening for. Not just a door, she was opening up for him. <clears throat> verse 6, the NLT says, I opened to my lover, but he was gone. My heart sank. I searched for him, but I couldn't find him anywhere. I called to him, but there was no reply. And again, remember, this was her great fear in chapter 3. It's coming back again to her that he will take off. Did he go with somebody else? Did he take off somewhere else? Where is he at? How come he's not here? I thought he loved me. Blah, blah, blah. The Hebrew text says literally, I opened four to my lover, but my lover had left. He was gone. I called to him, but he gave no answer. This clause is parallel to the previous one where she said, I sought him, but I couldn't find him. Um, but it's full of pain. She called out to her lover, but he gave her no reply. And Longman says he was gone because of her initial reluctance. He heard that rejecting word that just says, no, not tonight. No, I have a headache. And he runs off. The man goes and he hides in his hobbies and he hides in his own little world. Verse 7, to me, this, I always wonder, why did these watchmen show up? What do they have to do with anything? You know, it's like, who are these people anyway? Why does she keep having them? But maybe there's something here because she had, remember she had a dream with the watchmen previously. She, they were there. Watchmen are authority figures. They're like the not really police, but they were on the watchtower. They watch it. They're walking around at night, and they're on the tower. They're looking both outside the wall and inside the wall to see if there's any trouble. So here are the watchmen again. We already saw them in chapter 3, verse 3. They may, the reason that 
some people say they could have uh, beaten her up was because they mistaken her for a prostitute because prostitutes used to wear veils. And so you see there in verse 7 that they took her veil away. But I think that she had a veil on. We saw that earlier she had a veil on because she was married. Um, but anyway, there was. we're not told exactly why this happened, but the, they beat her up. They took her veil. Um, they didn't find her lover. They weren't even looking for her, but they did find her. That's what it says. The watchmen went about the city and they found me. And when they did, they ended up beating her up. The NLT says, the night watchmen found me as they made the rounds. They beat and bruised me and stripped off my veil. Those watchmen on the walls. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have seen this many times with women. When they have reoccurring dreams with the same people, and sometimes it's authority figures in their life or even insecurities. She has an insecurity here again that he's, she's going to lose him. Um, she's not facing them in her real life, but she is facing them in her dreams. And what I tell women is if you have reoccurring dreams with the same troubling thing happening, that you should make that a source of prayer because God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. And he wants you to live in peace and not live in fear of losing your husband or something going wrong or something going bad or an authority figure in your life that is maybe you don't even you're not aware of that you're afraid of. Or maybe you were hurt when you were younger by an authority figure and you're not dealing with it. And here she is dealing with it again. And um, I've had women tell me this. I've had my wife tell me this, that. She'll wake up and she'll be a little bit scared. And I go, what happened? She goes, I, 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 I dreamed that I looked over next to my bed and you were gone. You know, there's that fear. And um, that she would be alone. She would be by herself. And women, a lot of women have those fears and insecurities. There's insecurities that come out in dreams that women are not willing to face in real life. Well, God has not given us a spirit of fear. We can pray and ask the Lord to help us. Um, Hugh Weiler here, I'm not going to read all through this detail, but she basically makes the statement that this is one of the strongest reasons why you can conclude that this was a dream because there's no aftermath. These watchmen don't get in trouble. Nothing else happens. That doesn't, the, the man doesn't come and beat up the watchmen because he found out what they did to his wife. Nothing like that happens. And so they're pretty sure then that this is really narrating a dream that she has and this these are the things that happen in dreams where suddenly you're in a scene and then before you know it you're in some other scene and it's it changes right away <clears throat> as we study chapter 5 verse 7 through 16 we see that the woman has regrets about rejecting him now she wants him back in this case she realizes she's made a mistake and um we want to say that uh, sometimes when um, you're not in a right relationship with your husband or your wife and a bad things happen, you begin to think, oh, I, I need to make it right with my husband. And maybe God was dealing with her here in this dream. Um, and uh, how many of you found, like, I've seen this happen in my life, like if I have a, I'm mad at my wife or my wife's mad at me and we're not, you know, we're doing the silent treatment or we're just upset at each other and then, we go about our day and something bad happens. We think, oh, man, I, I need to get it right with my wife. I need to get right with my husband. We, we, you know, we, we, we think in those terms that something bad happened because we're not right with the people. In a way, there's something that's there because Peter said that we need to dwell with um, wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And, and with our wives, who are the weaker vessel, he says, lest our prayers be hindered. We don't want to be in a bad relationship with our wife because God won't answer our prayers. And there's a story that's told by Pastor Tom Nel Tommy Nelson that um, um, wrote a commentary on the song of songs that was so humorous uh, about what he did one time with his wife, uh, Teresa. And, you know, they had been married for quite a while at this point, maybe over 30 years. And um, one day, how many you know sometimes joking around can go the wrong way? <laughs> You joke with somebody or you joke with your wife and they don't take it as a joke. And um, so one day he woke up, his wife was next to him in the morning, and jokingly 
he told her, he said, woman, get up and go make me some breakfast right now. I'm your husband like that. He kind of said it that way. Well, she did not take that as a joke at all. And he saw in the midst of all the blankets and everything, he saw this, this uh, pile right there. and He thought it was the blanket. Well, he got a ruler that was at the side of his bed and he hit the pile of blankets and he goes, and get up and do it right now. It was her leg that he hit and he hit her leg like that. And, you know, she yelled out and he got scared and he ran out. <laughs> he ran out of the room there and he went over to the kitchen to make her breakfast now because he realizes, man, I really goof this up big time. Well, he went and got some orange juice, and it was one of those pressurized containers. <laughs> and while he's opening it up, it just went right over his whole face, you know. <laughs> he has this orange juice all over him. And then he went over to get a towel to uh, clean his face up. And when he reached down, he hit his head, and he got a cut right on his head. So he's bleeding now from the, t from the top of his head. <laughs> And he realized, he, it just kind of hit him right there, you know, God was dealing with him, you know, that he was joking around with his wife like he did, and it, was, it just all went sour for him. Well, <clears throat> what we want to say here now as we kind of come out of this uh, thing of conflict, um, in conflict and in strife and when we're disagreed so often, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to change the other person. We want to get the other person doing what we want them to do, and we want to change them. And that's one of the biggest mistakes we can make. And we've said this before. We cannot even change ourselves. And we're trying to change somebody else that we have no control over, you know. That's a total exercise in futility is trying to change your husband or trying to change your wife. Like my wife says, I've been trying to change you for almost 30 years now, and you have not changed. So <laughs> give up. Just give up the ghost. And I remember when uh, the first couple years I was married, I was so frustrated with my wife because she wasn't as spiritual as I thought I, she should be, and I was frustrated. And I went and talked to my pastor, and I said, Pastor, there's something wrong with my wife. She's not as spiritual as I thought she was. My wife, my pastor, I don't know what he told me, but when I was driving home from that meeting, I just said, Lord, I give up. I'm not, I can't change her. She won't change. I've been trying to change her. It doesn't work. And a woman does not want to be controlled by another, by a man. She does not want to be controlled. She wants to be free to act in her relationship with God. She wants to be free. She doesn't need control. Well, when you're insecure, if you're a very insecure man like I was early on in my marriage relationship, you become a control freak. And control freaks frustrate their wives, man, vice versa. You have a control freak in the home. He's a very insecure man or insecure woman. They try to control them, and that's when things go really downhill. But what we need to learn to do is, as I did that day, I told the Lord, I said, I'm giving her up to you. And... We need to um, not take matters in our own hands, and we need to do what Jesus did in First Peter, where he says, when they hurled their insults at him, and Peter was right there to see it, when they hurled their insults at Jesus, he said he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And that's one of the hardest lessons to learn as we're disagreed with our wife or disagreed with our husband. We're wanting to change them ourselves rather than trusting the Lord to work things out in our marriage relationship. In verse 5, in this verse, the woman addresses these daughters of Jerusalem. And then in the next verse, verse 9, the women are going to address this woman and they're going to ask her some questions. And then when she's done, she's going to address them from verse 10 to verse 16, when she finishes, you'll see the last words of verse 16. She says, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. So she's been talking. This is girl talk now. So from verse 9 all the way down to verse 16, these are girls, uh, a group of girls talking to the, to the Shulamite, and the Shulamite's talking to the group of girls. And so this is a lot of girl talk here. <clears throat> um, 
If you remember when here in verse 9, verse 8, she's charging them, right? I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem. And before, it was always about not awakening or arousing love until the right time. But this time, she's not saying that. It's not about arousing, not arousing love. She says, I want you to tell my husband when you find him, I am weak, I am faint with love. She's longing for him. She wants him. He's lost, and she wants him. Um, the NCV says, promise me, women of Jerusalem, if you find my lover, tell him I am weak with love. And the USB, United Bible Society translators say, here I am sick is an idiomatic way of saying she longs for his love. She wants him. She realizes she's made a mistake, and now she wants him back. <clears throat> Okay, so let's read now verses 9 through 16. And now the woman is going to praise this man, this man that ran away, <laughs> at least for the night. She's going to praise him. So the, the daughters here in verse 9 are going to ask her two questions, and then she's going to answer those questions from verses 10 through 16. So they said, what is your beloved or your lover more than, any, more than another beloved? O fairest among women, or most beautiful women, what is your beloved more than any another beloved that you would charge us to go look for him? If I was there and I had a recorder and I could hear their voice, I, could, I would basically be hearing them say, this guy's a rat. He left you. He took off. And why, should, why is he any better than any? Why are you telling us to go look for him? What's so good about him? There's, so this... Uh, why did the Lord put this in here? Why did the Lord put this whole question thing of these daughters of Jerusalem? It's really a literary device that's being used to bring out what's really deep inside the woman. They ask her these questions. What's so special about your man? What's so good about him that you're actually asking us to go look for him? So it's going to give you a chance to hear what's really in a woman's heart. And so that's what he's, she's going to do, starting with verse 10, my beloved or my lover is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the rivers of waters, washed with milk and fit, fitly set. His cheeks are like a bed of spices, banks of scented herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. There we have it again with the lilies and the liquid myrrh. His hands are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is carved ivory inlaid with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of fine gold. That's the third time she used gold. So this is the golden boy she's describing here. His countenance is like Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. And then she goes back again to the mouth and kissing. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my lover, my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And and in fact, in verse 1 of the next chapters, which we'll cover next week, they change their mind about him just based entirely on what she said about him. <clears throat> They're going to say, oh, man, this guy really is something. And by the way, you ladies, if you find a guy like this, tell me who he is because we've never seen a guy like this. Okay. <laughs> You know, with pillars and it looked like this marble statue with tanned guy, you know, with beautiful hair, you know. And uh, most of us, you know, we have hairy legs and we got pot belly and we're, we're out of shape and we don't have a six pack, you know, abs like he, he says he has these beautiful abs and everything. And well, we all long, the women long for a guy like that, you know, this beautiful bronzed guy that looks just wonderful, you know. Well, I, I wear long sleeve shirts because I hide this buffed body that I have underneath, you know. <clears throat> Verse 9, one translation says, Beautiful woman, how is your lover different from the other lovers? Is your lover better than the other lovers? Is that why you... Ask us to make this promise to you. See, he says, oh, most beautiful of women, why is the one you love more special than others? Why do you ask us to tell him how you feel? Why are we going to go out and look for this guy and say, hey, by the way, your, your, your wife is looking for you and she's sick with love for you. And literally in the Hebrew, Longman points out what it says is, what is your lover 
from a lover. So basically, we, what is he better than any other? This is, this is a run-of-the-mill guy. There's a dime a dozen like him, you know. He's, he's here one day, and he's out the next day, and he's, he's in and out, you know. So they're really asking, how does your lover stand out from all the other? What's so special about him, in other words? What, 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 is, what is so special that he's going to stand out um, compared to any other man? And so she then gives this beautiful description of her man from verses 10 through 16. Hugh Waller says, The woman could be asking, What makes your lover so special that we should bother helping you to find him? And I want to say uh, also, while I'm here, to be careful when there's, because see, remember, they just had an argument. He's gone. He's upset. And now she's trying to find him. And she's going to go talk to the girls. You know, help me find this guy. And what I want to say here is that when there is strife in a home, and I want to say this to the women in particular, be careful who you go talk to, especially other women. When you're having conflict, strife, or misunderstanding with your husband. You know why? Because I've seen this. I saw it in my workplace when I was in a workplace one time. These girls get behind cubicles and they start talking. Yeah, my husband, he did this to me last night. And you start talking to a woman who's been hurt or been divorced or got abused by her husband. Yeah, you ought to leave that rat. He's no good, you know. And before you know it, they feed stuff into your mind that poison your spirit and can poison your relationship. And I have even seen here um, counseling with men and women. I'll, I'll talk to the woman. She goes, my husband's a rat, and he, he, he's like all the other men. And, and I go, well, where did you get that information from? Well, you should go talk to the women at where I work. They all have the same thing. Their husbands do the same thing to them. They've already done all that kind of stuff, and he's just doing the same thing. And I go, where did you hear all that? Well, I was at the, we were having a coffee break, and we started talking about it. And all of a sudden, you hear, where are they getting their direct, where are they getting seeds planted into their mind they're not getting it from the lord they're getting it from other people and it may even be people who don't know the lord and as much as i like to say that that doesn't happen it happens a lot that people are talking to other people and what i say is spend a lot more time talking to god than talking to others many relationships have been poisoned by ungodly counsel from other people it happens a lot. <clears throat> Top of page 79, verse 10. My lover is tanned and radiant. He would stand out among 10,000 men. In other words, she's saying he's one in a million. He stands out above everybody else. He has no equal. And this word here for white, the word white there, <clears throat> to ah, is dazzling, bright. You know, um, ruddy is rosy. He's like they, they, a lot of the commentators say that means he's healthy, he's strong. The word here, chief, he's chief among 10,000 is the word that means, it basically means somebody who is raising a flag. So like there's 10,000 people and there's one right there that's raising the flag. In other words, he's standing out among all the people that are there. She says, I can spot him a mile away. He's very conspicuous. Nelson says, a woman began to dwell on all the wonderful aspects of her husband, those things that set him apart from other men and made him so special to her. One of the practices that I've had in marriage counseling, when men or women are fighting, they're arguing, they come here in the parking lot in separate cars, they're sitting on one side and one sitting on the other side before they used to hold hands, before they used to kiss and hug, and now one's on one side of the table, one's on the other side of the table, they're arguing back and forth, they're blaming each other for everything. One of the questions I'll ask is I'll say, what was it that drew you to this guy in the first place? What, what, what caused you to be fall for him? And all of a sudden, she goes, well, he was so nice, and he was friendly to me, and he treated my mom really nice, and I saw how he sacrificed for people, and he was real kind to the poor. So, and then all of a sudden, there's this smile on his face. He was a really a nice guy. And, he's, and, and you know what? We need to dwell on those things, because when you have moments of crisis like that where there's disagreement, you need to dwell on the good qualities of your husband and your wife, because that's going to hold you and sustain you. 
Verse 11 says, his head is fine as gold. His wavy hair is black as a raven. Another says, his hair is like the purest gold. His hair is curly and black as a raven. So gold is found in verse 11 and in verse 14. His hands, his head, his, what else? Verse 15, his legs, feet. This is the golden boy. <laughs> From head to toe, she sees him as really nice. And so as the man did in chapter 4 when he was describing his wife, started at the top and went all the way down. So a woman's going to do the same thing. Starts with the head, goes to the eyes, goes to the cheeks, goes to the, his hands, his arms, his chest, his body. So she's describing how he is to her. <clears throat> Hubbard says the raven color is not only black without a tinge of gray, but it carries an iridescent sheen that glistens in the sunlight like the wings and body of the great black bird. Have you ever seen a raven in the light? They not only have really black, black feathers on them, but they have a shiny uh, uh, scene on them, you know. So, so again, this guy may have some Grecian formula or something or some grease in his hair, and he's looking really nice. <laughs> We have some people here in our church that grease up their hair really nice. All right. <clears throat> Verse 12. His eyes are a pair of doves bathed in a stream flowing with milk. Man, she is just using the flowery words. His eyes sparkle like doves behind springs of water. They are set like jewels washed in milk. Wow. You, you don't hear the guy say that. The guy is grunting, you know, in chapter 4, you know. You're cute. You're beautiful. You're cute. You're beautiful. You know, that's about all he can say. But this girl, she's got the words. To bathe in milk in some settings is an expression of lavishness and luxury, but here it is simply a figure for whiteness. Not all doves are white, of course, but the reference to milk suggests that this is a sense here. He's this beautiful, very nice looking man. <clears throat> and isn't it something we men, we want our wives to look nice, but sometimes the man doesn't realize, hey, you need to still look nice too for your wife, Right? Stay in shape, don't have a pot belly, you know, sh shave your legs every now and then, you know, whatever. <laughs> Bathe yourself, wash yourself down, put underarm spray. Your wife wants this nice looking, nice smelled, shaved up guy. Doesn't want to have a guy that's, you know, well, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> All right. Verse 13. <clears throat> His lips are like lilies dripping with myrrh. The point here is not the color of the young man's lips, but rather the delight his kisses give his lover. Lilies, as a simile for his lips, convey the notion of sweet kisses. <clears throat> and I'm looking at this picture and telling that guy, dude, kiss her. She wants to be kissed. What are you doing? Looking the wrong way. <clears throat> well, a woman wants to be wants to be kissed, and she's noticing his lips, and they're dripping liquid myrrh. And she's also going to point that out again as we get to verse 16 about his lips. And remember what she said, starting out the Song of Songs, I want him to kiss me, kiss me with the kisses a little, kiss me over and over again. She wants that, she likes that. <clears throat> so brush your teeth too, man, amen? Smell good. Good breath. Use breath mints if you have to. Kiss your wife. <clears throat> Verse 14. His arms are like gold rods filled with jewels. Wow. His body is like smooth ivory with sapphires set in it. Wow. My wife's never said that to me. <laughs> His arms are branches of gold covered with jewels. His body is ivory decorated with sapphires. Hmm. The body, like ivory and marble, speaks of beauty and strength. Glickman says his abdomen is a plate of ivory covered with sapphires, the princess tells him. He has rippling stomach muscles. Well, some of us have a six-pack and some of us have a barrel, amen? <laughs> well, you know what? You know, my wife sometimes she grabs along the side here and she says, you need to get in shape here. You're out of shape, so... Well, our, our wives also, we don't want to look at somebody that looks gone, you know. We want to look 
stay in good shape, you know, stay strong, right, Pastor Rick? You do exercises, you stay, Pastor Rick, strong, push-ups, exercising, you got to stay in shape, not just for the wives, for the husbands, but the men, for their wives. <clears throat> Verse 15, his legs are columns of marble on feet of gold, wow, he stands there majestic like Mount Lebanon and its choice cedar trees, wow, this lady has the words. His legs are like marble pillars set in sockets of finest gold, the NLT says. His posture is stately like the noble cedars of Lebanon. Wow, she has the flowery words. But again, she's praising her husband. Again, she's responding to the questions, why should we seek this guy for you and go look for him for you? She's telling him why, because he's so beautiful and valuable and uh, of worth to her. The countenance here stands for the entire appearance. Lebanon means the best, the finest, because the mountains of Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon were the best. Excellence of cedars captures the grandeur and quality of his entire stature and bearing. He is a man worth looking for. <clears throat> Both the head and the legs are gold. Both of these extremes are described as gold, which suggests that the man is gold from head to toe, so thoroughly gold. So she sees him as a very, very valuable man. <clears throat> Verse 16, his mouth is sweetness itself. I love that wording. His mouth is sweetness itself. And I love what she says. How does it word it here in the New King James? He is altogether lovely. Wow, what a statement. The NLT says he is desirable in every way. So this, she's telling him, oh, women of Jerusalem, this is my lover. This is my friend right here. The NCV says, his mouth is sweet to kiss, and I desire him very much. Yes, daughters of Jerusalem, this is my lover and my friend. The United Bible Society translators using an alternate translation for this. What she's saying is his kisses are delicious. I long for every part of him. Longman says he concludes with a comment about his mouth. Indeed, his inner mouth or palate. The word there, uh, shech in Hebrew, means the inside, the upper part of your mouth. So again, we're talking about the kissing and the honey and the milk that are in the mouth. The implicit message is that she wants to taste him. Her comments anticipate a deep kiss. So again, she's longing to be kissed. This is the way people get aroused in a marriage relationship. <clears throat> And I like the um, wording here. Oh, yeah, I'm going to say it here on this last slide. A man, uh, this is, of course, the other way around, too, but a man needs a woman who will be his best friend. We, we need that. My, I need for my wife to be my best friend. Dr. Knight, George Knight, uh, his translation of the Hebrew here uh, in his uh, commentary says, but says it this way, he is altogether desirable. That is how you will recognize my beloved, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem. I mean, he's the most desirable of all the guys. Out of the 10,000, he's the one guy that I want the most. That's what she's saying. He's unique, he's mine, and he's the guy that I want. That's how you're going to tell that he's my lover. And I like this where it says, this is what my lover is like. This is what my friend truly is, women of Jerusalem. So I like those words there, um, verse 16. This is my beloved. This is my friend. This, this is how you can tell who he is. He's my friend. He's my lover. Uh, we sang, uh, I think it was either last week, last Sunday, or the Sunday before, we sang the song called This Is My God. And uh, it's a very powerful song, but in there it's talking about, you know, Jesus dying on the cross for us. His, he redeemed us. He set us free. And, and the song concludes, this is my God. This is who he is, you know. And I see the same thing here. That's what this lady, this woman is saying, you know. That this, this man that's lovely, that's sweet, that I love, that, that I admire, that I'm looking up to, that he's beautiful to me. That's who he is. This, he's mine. He's my friend. He's my lover. That's who you're going to be looking for. 
And again, in the next, very next verse, they're going to say, okay, we better go look for him then. <laughs> we better go seek him. We're, we're going to seek him for you, with you. We're going to go look for him then because of the way she described it. Isn't that amazing? They changed their whole attitude based entirely on what she said about him. The whole view. And you know what? You can make your husband to look like a rat by the words you speak. Or you can make him look like a million dollars. So, um, one of the things I would say in the moment of conflict, in the moment of strife, uh, for the women, stay positive. Don't give up. Trust God. And magnify the good qualities of your husband. Rather than go tell another woman how bad he is, why don't you highlight why you married him? <laughs> Remember Philippians 4, eight, right? Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are honorable, whatever things are of a good report, whatever things are peaceable. I forgot all that Paul wrote there in Philippians. He goes, think on these things. And when we're in conflict and when we're upset at our husband, we're upset at our wife, we need to focus on the good that they are. If there's any virtue, yeah, then highlight that. And when you look at your wife, you look at your husband, and you're upset, <laughs> you need to go back to that. So this is going to turn the whole attitude of the daughters, and we'll start there next week in chapter 6. So they were all excited. They fell in love. They got married. They had sex, and then they had a fight. <laughs> that's the way it goes, right? All right. Okay. Any questions, comments?